everyone, Kelsey here. Just before the episode starts, I just wanted to say that I was messing around with my OBS software's audio recording, and I don't think I got it quite right with recording our voices. It's a little off, and also the internet bandwidth started to get a little stretched thin near the end, so you'll also hear some clipping and stuttering in that audio. But please enjoy this March episode. Hey everyone, welcome back to Navajo Tea Time. This is the March 2021 episode. Hope you guys are all doing good and enjoying the warm weather if you have it. Hey everyone, Adrian here, joining Kelsey in this March episode. Welcome back to Navajo Tea Time. Yeah, so I guess March is Women's History Month. Hmm. How long has that been a thing? God, I didn't even do my research. <laughs> it's okay. It's been a while. <laughs> I didn't know March was Women's History Month. I just saw it on my calendar. It's like, first day of Women's History Month. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking it up right now. So in honor of Women's History Month, um... We are going to talk about women that we look up to, um, women in history who have had an impact on us. Yeah. Did you want me to go first? Yeah, go for it. Okay. So for Women in History Month, um, back in, I don't know what year, but either my freshman year or sophomore year of high school, I remember watching this history channel um, about a photojournalist. Her name was Dickie Chappelle, Chappelle, something. Um, You can check out the spelling in the description. But she was just this really awesome, badass photojournalist who actually did a lot of the combat training alongside of the soldiers because she was going to need that endurance and the know-how because she's right there with them photographing war times and she was the only female photojournalist in Japan during World War II because they put a ban on female photojournalists being in combat situations but she went anyways and I always thought that was pretty cool um (laughs) and I was when I was watching the history channel of her that's what they were talking about and I just really liked how much she didn't care what other people thought her limits should be and Uh she was like if men have to go to war then it's my job to photograph the the struggles that they're going through and I always thought that was pretty cool and ballsy of her I guess (laughs) yeah And she was with the Marines, and my family, they're a big Marine Corps family. I don't say a Marine Corps family, but a lot of the veterans in my family are Marines. So it's just that kind of parallel and um, something that resonates with me. Uh, But she passed away during the Vietnam War when she was photographing there. But all the soldiers remember her as, like, someone who was really down-to-earth, gritty, and not afraid to get in the mud and the dirt with them. And that's something the soldiers really appreciated. She was like, oh, I'm a photojournalist. I can't get my hands dirty. She was always right Uh there next to them. Uh And she was the only photojournalist who parachute down with the paratroopers during Vietnam. Like, she was the only one combat-ready, combat-trained to do that. So that's what she did. And... One of her instructors said, there's no point in closing your eyes when you jump. So when when she did her jump, she said she was just clicking away her camera, just taking photos on the way down. And I'm afraid of heights. I'm afraid of falling. So just thinking about that um, sends my adrenaline up. But she was really cool in that way. So she had a passion for telling stories that she wanted to tell. And she told them the way she wanted to tell them, you know, like it was... She was passionate about the story she was telling, and she wasn't going to let anyone tell her not to tell them. So in that sense, she's kind of like my mom and my grandmothers and my aunts, 
in that they're gonna do what they're passionate about um regardless of what anyone tells them for better or worse so like i have two aunts who were in the marine corps and one of them is really into photography and the other aunt she i have one aunt cheryl she's in photography and my other aunt birdie she's also marine but not into photography but she's like five feet two inches uh-huh. And so um, Dickie, she was also a really short, statured lady. So <laughs> it's just kind of an interesting parallel doing more research into um, this phone of journalists and how they relate to my aunts that I also look up to. Awesome. Wow. She sounds like a super amazing woman. Yeah. And doing this research, it was really hard trying to find her name specifically because I vaguely remembered her from mm-hmm. that history channel show so many years ago and it was really hard to find her name and her credit and uh-huh. i actually had to break out my old college day research in topic methods you know like where you put the little parentheses around some of the words to narrow down your google search and everything uh-huh. i really broke out my research <laughs> skills there i finally found her article on national geographics and one um part of it was saying that her name, her credit title for some of the um, photos she took was stripped because she defied the order in World War II to not be deployed with the other uh-huh. um, Marines to take photos. So they kind of like wow. removed her title. I'm like, well, that's rude. <laughs> but there's also a bunch of other women photographers during wartime, and they're not ver- mentioned very much. And I just thought that was really interesting. Wow, that's cool. You should um, include the link on our YouTube channel. Yeah, all the, all the links yeah. that we have and everything will be in the description below. That's cool. All right, there's, um, there are two women who I wanted to bring up for, um, to celebrate Women's History Month. So the quick research I ran on Google, <laughs> as of March 7th, 1982, this day has been designated, or this month has been designated as Women's History, History Month. So, kind of cool. Exactly um, 38, 39 years in America. So, it's kind of cool. But, um, yeah. So, anyways. Um, <laughs> um, the two women who I look up to and who have had a huge influence on me, two women in history, are um, Roberta Blackgoat and Annie Dodge Wanika, both of which are super badass Neh women who I look up to greatly. Um, Roberta Blackgoat, she is a part of the uh, Zithla Bay resistors uh, on Black Mesa, and she was one of the, you know, the women who fought against the, um, the BIA, a.k.a the Beast in America, a.k.a. the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Yeah, and she was someone who did not back down, and I think she's been kind of a touchstone for many resistors since because, you know, her fighting spirit lives on today. Um, Annie Dodge Wanika, she did a lot for, um, I guess, health equity on the Navajo Nation. She was she was very accomplished. Um, She's been named kind of like the mother of education on Navajo, but she's also she's also um, someone who led a lot of, I guess, innovative things for Navajo people, um, really making a place for us. She was a council member. She was also someone who spoke with a lot of our leaders in Washington. Um, I believe she actually like, um, like, smacked a senator (laughs) (laughs) she's like really cool i know she's all awesome and you know during the last um i guess during the last pandemic you know there was this huge um i think it was tuberculosis that was running rampant on the navajo nation and she was one of the people that really fought to make sure that families were getting the health care the quality health care that they deserved so that the people could survive. So, you know, she did a lot for reform, for legislation, for standing up for the people, as did um, Roberta Blackgoat. 
So those are the two women that I, I look up to greatly. I think we should definitely definitely honor them and always remember them too, because you know, if it wasn't for them, I think a lot of us would be like I think the Navajo Nation would be in a different place. I think, you know, the people the people's voice and the people's sovereignty would also be, I think it would be shifted differently too if there weren't these strong women who stand up and really um, encourage, you know, the men of our nation to rally together and, and fight for a greater cause. In Diné culture, you know, women have always been the pillars of their communities and their families. And, you know, I say that all the time. I always want to remind women that, you know, we are not above, below men in society. We should be right there next to them side by side because they need us just as much as we need them. And together we can accomplish a lot. Yeah, for sure. Sometimes we can yeah. see it where like, sometimes women can be or overbearing or like sometimes, you know, there's, sometimes you, you can tell when there's an imbalance of power in a, a household. And every time I've been in one of those households, it just feels really uncomfortable. Sure. Like either yeah, either yeah. the men has too much power, or the woman has too much power, or asserts too much power. I don't say has too much. Their, their dominance. Yeah. It just feels like a very awkward house to be in. Yeah, it is interesting when you feel that power imbalance, and it's 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 skewed in a way that you know that somebody is getting you know walked all over, and you can feel it with like every fiber of your being. You just know like on a molecular level that something's wrong <laughs> yeah it's just it's kind of like that base instinct when you're like at a friend's house and then your friend's parent starts yelling at them and you're like um should i go and it's just kind of that feeling when you walk into a house and you like see the power dynamic be a couple or something <laughs> yeah for sure i mean you know we have this concept of hajan and hajan is really all about maintaining that that balance where things can thrive. It's a delicate balance, you know, that we have to work toward. And it's not something that can exist 100% of the time, but it should be something that we're striving for 100% of the time in the way we, you know, run our homes. And that's another interesting thing too in Diné culture and philosophy is that, you know, they say the home is the woman's universe and that's her space. That's where she rules and has she does have inherent dominance in that space so she can run that household how she sees fit. And I think when other people in the family understand that and respect it, you know, it really is, it really can be a more harmonious space, but only if the woman takes on that role and stands as a leader and decides to, you know, really lead by example and um, use that position of power in a good way. Something that like, what are you laughing about? <laughs> Me? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> no, there, it, it's just you always go into like these big philosophical things, and I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah that's what I do all the time. <laughs> I'm like, can we go deep here? <laughs> <laughs> you just go and get on your soapbox, and I'm like, okay, dude. I have, you know, we have this platform, and <laughs> I just, I think I just get. I get really bored with conversations right away when they're just like so, so shallow. And I think that's why I'm kind of like, well, you know what? We have this platform to talk about something deeper. Why not? But we don't, I know, I, know, I guess I'm always like that. I think that's what kind of, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with me, but <laughs> that's just where my, my head is all the time. I'm just like, you know, you got, we're given this voice. Let's use it, you know, let's use it for something good. First of all, Adrian, nothing's wrong with you. <laughs> I don't know. It's just sometimes I'm like, okay, because, you know, I don't, mostly I don't agree with Navajo philosophy. I don't know much about Navajo philosophy to contribute other than my lived experiences. So when you start getting really deep into like philosophy and teachings and stuff, I'm like, uh huh. <laughs> That's just oh, me. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. Michael's funny. He, he perfected his accent. So sometimes I'll, I'll be talking and he'll go, Ezra? He goes, Ezra? <laughs> like, really? Like, really heavily. It's funny. 
said, Erza? I was just like, shut up. <laughs> it's so funny. I should I should record him. It's hilarious. But make it your anyway, ringtone. Ew, every time he calls. <laughs> Um, so one thing I wanted to add real quick, though, to the Women's History Month topic is I also wanted to just give a shout out to, you know, my grandma, my mom and my aunties, because, you know, they weren't the kind of women that were like, really out there in the community, you know, doing a lot all the time, you know, like Annie Dodge Wanika or, you know, um, Roberta Blacko, they weren't out there on the front lines, they weren't out there, you know, um, really making these big moves in the public eye, but, you know, back home, the way they run their homes and the way they keep our families together, you know, like, I think a lot, you know, all those small acts really do contribute to the strength of our family, because, you know, my aunts are, my, I, you know, my mom has, a, has four sisters, and, the eldest sister, she lives in the Tonalia area, and she was actually, her name is Amelia, and she was actually um, kind of brought into the family and raised by my grandma and my, and my Che, and she's considered the oldest sister. And then my Aunt Renee lives in California, and my other two aunts live in Tonalia, and they they've taught me so much about patience. They taught me so much about, you know, trying to seek out knowledge and information. Um, they're really assertive. Like no one messes with my aunties. Like they will whip you, <laughs> you know, they're really assertive. They're really strict, but you know, they taught me that a lot of these, you know, rules that they, they had, they were put in place there because they were meant to protect me and they were meant to guide me and they were meant to teach me things so that one day when I have my own family, I'll know how to run it. And I think sometimes when you have really strict family, especially women in the family, sometimes you're, you're scared of them or sometimes you like don't like them because they don't let you get away with everything or because they discipline you hard. And as I've gotten older, I've realized that that hard discipline when it's done out of love, it really can um, add to your character, and it can it can give you a lot. It'll give you what you need to continue on throughout your life and get through the hard times. And that's what they taught me. You know, a lot of their teachings and a lot of their lectures and a lot of the whippings I got. <laughs> I believe that those are the things that got me through some of the hardest times of my life. So. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of throw that in there real quick because I think sometimes women think, well, I'm not contributing a lot or I'm not doing a lot. I'm not out there, you know, making these big moves. But I think, you know, the little small moves that are, are very meaningful, those have a huge impact too. So, yeah, for to sure. Think. Like my mom has nine sisters, so there's 10 of them all together. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was funny when you said like, oh, yeah, my aunts have taught me patience. And usually when I read, oh, this person has taught me patience, it's usually like I'm having patience with them because some, but I'm not sure if that's exactly what you mean, but I can no, like, <laughs> like, I meant like waiting around on them all the time, <laughs> understanding that it's not my time, it's their time. You know what I mean? Like, you got to sit still, you got to be quiet, you got to wait. So that was my whole life, like, when I was a kid, just, I felt like I was always on other people's time, and I had to be, I had to control myself enough to, like, not have a fit, you know, or not cry or complain and stuff like that, because otherwise I'll get whipped. <laughs> I know, like, one of my aunts on my dad's side, so my mom and dad broke up, and every time I was at my dad's house, he doesn't have us all the time, so it's, like, almost free reign. Uh -huh. so when you're with the um, not, I don't know, not dominant parent. That's not the word. I don't, the one who doesn't have custody. Sometimes, like when you go visit them, and their family members, they kind of like spoil you and let you do whatever you want. 
no, my aunt, she's like, nope, you guys got, you're here, you're doing dishes, you're cleaning the house, you're doing all this stuff. So I understand what you mean about, like, you know, the tough love from aunts and stuff, and you, you appreciate it later on, but when you're a kid, you just want to, you know, lay around and watch TV or play outside. You don't want to sweep the floor or do the dishes or anything. Uh-huh. But yeah, she's... She's very important in my life, and I appreciate everything she's done for me and my siblings. Because I'm sure we weren't the best kids. And my dad, my dad would be like, hey, those are my kids. You don't tell my kids what to do. So putting up with him probably wasn't the best either. <laughs> and dads are a whole other story. I can't wait to have that conversation about dads and fatherhood um, yeah. in June. Yeah. Hey, when's Men's History Month? All of history is men's history. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, because there's Mother's Day, which is in May, and then Father's Day, which is what you're talking about, which is in June. But we're talking yeah. about these women in history, Women's Month. Well, I guess we'll talk more about our moms in May for Mother's Day. So, yeah. yeah, that'd be cool. And maybe we could talk a little bit about motherhood also, because... There's a lot of tea that could be spilled there. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be kind of cool, though, huh? To have people ask, like, submit questions about motherhood and things like that. We could have that conversation. Sure. If we want to open that can of worms. Why not? All it's right. supposed to be like a, yeah, <laughs> I think that'd be cool. I'm interested to see what questions would come in. <laughs> In for Mother's Day and Father's Day, they're all, how many baby daddies do you got? Oh <laughs> <laughs> well, well <laughs> or baby mamas, or baby mamas. I know, huh? <laughs> Just opens it all up for everything. <laughs> Anyways, all right. Next topic: Mars. Let's move on. Have you seen the Mars photos? Yeah, I did. I thought they were pretty cool. It was really interesting. I haven't been able to sit down with Frankie yet and have her look at the photos because they had one of those 360 photo things where you move the mm-hmm. phone around. I'm doing the hand motions, but you can't see me like where like you move the phone around and like you can see it in the 3D space. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I saw one like that. It was um, Mars at night. Oh my god, that looks so cool. Yeah, because I wanted to show her that because last month just before the Mars landing, she'd look up at the sky. She's like, oh, look, it's a planet. Look at the planets. I'm like, oh, I'm going to show her what a planet looks like. But I haven't had the time to sit down and show her again. But she's re- she really loves the stars and everything. But it's amazing how much it looks just like the reservation. It sure does. Oh, my goodness. Let me, um, so on March 4th, 2021, the Navajo Times released an article by Krista Allen. And the headline is, NASA engineer says Mars looks like Dinesakea. And in the quote, the, 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 the person who's quoted is Jared Yazzie. Oh, no, Aaron Yazzie, brother of Jared Yazzie, my bad. He, he said, especially to the city where my whole family is from. He's a 34-year-old mechanical engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. He said, it's not a coincidence. It makes sense that they look the same because Mars and Earth are terrestrial planets. They're both rocky planets. And then there's photos of, of Mars, and it looks very, very similar to that area between Tuba City and Cameron. Yeah. Um, if, you were, if you follow our Facebook or Instagram page, I posted a post Friday this past, I don't know, mm-hmm. on the... 5th of March and it says hashtag looks like Mars I took that photo I kind of brightened up the reds make it look a little more Marsy but like not a lot of editing was done that's what the photos look like <laughs> yeah I know I was like dang that looks like the rifle range Ew. <laughs> no that's that hill when you're coming up to tuba right past the airport hold on I don't know what you're talking about I was looking at the actual Mars photo Oh, the Mars photos. On my no. phone. Yeah. I was looking at the Mars photos, and I was just like, dang, it looks like a party spot. <laughs> no, the photo <laughs> I posted, the one I posted um, for the social media, for the hashtag looks like Mars. It's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That little turn off before you go down that really big hill, right before the junction or right after the junction. Yeah. 
I see it. Yeah, it sure does. Oh my goodness. So that's a that's really cool though that they actually have photos from another planet that we can you know kind of see what the train looks like. The nice detailed photos, not those um, yeah. kind of blurry black and white ones. Mm hmm. So in the hashtag looks like Mars, the top mm -hmm. post in Instagram, it I think mm -hmm. it's showing Shiprock. Really. Yeah, it has like 328 likes. It's called um, Metro underscore three yeah. underscore zero underscore three. It says Desert Southwest 2009. It doesn't say exactly where it's from, but it looks like those ship rock rocks. Yeah, I can see it. I always thought it's the ship. Yeah, 303. I see it. Those rocks always do look alien to me, off in the distance. Um, I don't know mm -hmm. if you've watched Dark Crystal. Yeah, I have. And you know how like they have that that spaceship kind of crashed into the ground, and it's just like this mm -hmm. really big tower in the middle of the desert. I'm like, I wonder if Jim um Jim Henson came out to Ship Rock and was like, "Oh look, an alien spaceship! I have my next movie." <laughs> but. <laughs> That's funny. I know. I love that area. The So I had never really been out to that side of the res until back in 2000. I think it was like 2018 or 2016. 2016. I was, um, I was invited by one of the council delegates to come to the, the chapter out there and um, speak on Maven and hopefully get some support for, from the entrepreneurial community out there. And I, I was traveling alone and Michael was telling me to take the Buffalo Pass route. I'd never been through there. I'd never even been through Staley. And she was like, yeah, it's a beautiful, you know, you'll, you'll like it. And so I was like, all right. So I was traveling from Flagstaff. So I was taking these res roads that I'd never driven before. And we drove, I drove from Flagstaff to Loop to Delcon and then to the junction, um, what's that place called? Um, anyways, on to Chinle, Saley, and at Saley, they were like, stop there, there's a food stand usually, they have really good mutton, and I was like, all right, so I stopped there, I got a, a roast mutton sandwich, I gotta say, it was not as good as the roast mutton sandwiches at the Tuba City Flea Market, I know I'm biased, but dang, I've been craving one of those so bad lately, they're so good, but I got us. I got. I got lunch, and then I headed toward the Kujigai over the Buffalo of uh, Buffalo Pass, and it was so beautiful. Oh my goodness! It was. It was like the most beautiful drive, and I went over the pass. And when you get to the very top of, like, you you get to the very top of the mountain, you can see Shiprock, and it's freaking gorgeous. And like red mesas below. And I just was thinking about all these stories that I had heard about um, the Warrior Twins, about Tolfesh's chain and Naya Nazarene, and I guess they had fought in that valley a long time ago. And they say that when they had killed, so I'm not sure if this is 100% sure, because I was told the story a long time ago, but when they fought Yaito, they, they had killed him, they beheaded him, and they said that the blood from his body was kind of covering the land that was coming from the area that was all red and it was covering the land. And I think it was 12 flesh's chain that had a staff and he drew a line in the sand and he drew it like, you know, in that area by Shiprock. And they say that when the blood reached that area, the blood kind of went up and it stopped. Like it didn't go past that line. And they say that's what that rock, those rocks are. And that was a story I had heard. And so when I saw it, I was just like so moved because I was like, dang, that's where they fought. You know, that's that's where they stood, you know, and it was crazy. And I drove down and I got to see it up close because I'd only seen aerial photos. And the aerial photos are pretty awesome. But when you're driving by it, it looks, it looks really cool. But it actually does, like when you're up close, it, it kind of does look like it was built. And I always ask the kids, like, does that look built to you, you know, because there's like segments that are, I don't know, it, it, it looks like it was built, and I was just like, is that like an ancient wall, you know what I mean, I don't know, but we always like wonder, we always wonder like, what is that, and I remember I, I used to work with an intern from NAU, he was a part of the ITEP program, 
and he was a geologist and he used to say they would go on all these trips around Navajo and they would look at those they would examine you know all these different formations and I used to like kind of grill him around the campfire like tell me more about this you know what do you think what did you find and he was like you know just nerd out and it was really fun (laughs) (laughs) I I like geology um I like looking at pretty rocks (laughs) Who doesn't like looking at pretty rocks? Um, <laughs> it's so fascinating just the way rocks form. I used to tell my younger siblings that if you bury a, like a pebble, it'll become a mountain. And my younger sister believed me for a while. But <laughs> That's cool. I know my sister is so gullible. I have a younger sister. She is so gullible. It was so funny. Like, my dad would always tell her all these tall tales, and she, like, always believed him. (laughs) And then, like, a year later or years later, she'd be like, that wasn't true. Like, it was finally done on her. And it was so funny. I used to always laugh about it, and she'd be like, shut up, Adrian. (laughs) You know what? My youngest brother's that way. We used to tell him, my mom used to tell him all these little white lies because he was ADHD. (laughs) And once he got an idea stuck in his head, he was like, I gotta do it. So, like, they went, they were in California sometime visiting some people. And he's like, I wanna go to the ocean. I wanna go to the ocean. And the mother, I'm sorry, the ocean's closed for cleaning today. He's like, ah, oh, okay. And then, remember, like, talking back on it, thinking back on it, he's like, well, you know what? I was a kid and you're supposed to believe your mom. I don't know why your mom's lying to you. My sister says, she's like, I trusted you. You're supposed to tell me the truth. That's what he says, too. He's like, you're supposed to tell me the truth. I'm not, I'm supposed to trust you, and here you are lying to me this entire time, and my whole world is shattered. Yeah. It's all funny, and, like, when she's upset, she'll say stuff like that. Like, well, you lied to me, and it's it's so funny to me. Like, I always crack up, and she gets mad. It's just that innocence of, like, you know, they're your parents, yeah. they're not supposed to lie to you, so why would they lie to you? I know, it's so sweet. I'm just like, oh, you just believe everything. <laughs> so sweet. Me, I'm so horrible. I don't believe nothing. I'm just like, whatever, prove it. <laughs> it's like the worst kid ever. Photos or it like, didn't happen. <laughs> Seriously, huh? <laughs> All right, so the next topic that we're going to talk about. Oh, do you have any last things to say about the Mars photos? No. Or it looks like Mars hashtag? Or- if you want to post more um, photos, we'll look at yeah. them and re- react to them. Show us your, your photography skills or how good your camera phone is. Yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> we should do that. So on our page, post up your pictures and use the hashtag looks like Mars. But then also tag us in it. All right, so the next thing we were going to talk about this being March and it being one year later since the pandemic was officially declared. Oh, yeah, one year later, pandemic. So for me, I was filming the Asha Beauty grand opening. Mm -hmm. And that was a pretty exciting thing. Um. Me and Urian were out in Window Rock. You know, I, I've never spent more time in Window Rock than I than when I was working with Seiki. Like, uh-huh. I, I've never been to Window Rock before I started that job. I've never even driven out that way because I've never had a reason to go to Window uh-huh. Rock or drive that way. Uh-huh. And it's really nice and woodsy out there. Uh-huh. <laughs> it is. It's really nice. I always, like, yeah, like, some of the nicer areas of the res, I always tell people, like, don't tell anybody about it, you know? More people are going to want to come out here. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, there's some really nice areas out there. And then if you follow the mountain this way, oh, my goodness, it's so gorgeous. That's what I was doing then. My mom had spring break, like, a week or two later. And, mm-hmm. hey, for spring break, let's go visit Charles before we can never see him again. Oh no, I know. It's so sad. Jeez. I um when when you brought this topic up, I went to my memories on Facebook yesterday and I saw that one year ago today I was I was sitting on a panel with the Division of Economic Development 
and with faculty and professors at Dinner College. And they were hosting this event called Revisioning the Navajo Economy and pulling people together to kind of discuss what the future of the Navajo economy would look like. And it was in preparation for the Tribal Economic Summit and for RES, which is also happening in, in Las Vegas. So the idea was, you know, how do we pull together some of our, you know, how do we pull our brains together and, you know, have this conversation and start talking about solutions. And I was asked to sit on as a representative of my company, but also to, you know, talk about my experience working with um, entrepreneurs, small business owners, and working for um, incubators that, you know, try to assist and help um, people grow their businesses. So that was really fun. And looking there, looking at that photo, it was just like, you know, none of us were thinking about what the, you know, we were, none of us were thinking like, oh, a pandemic is going to hit and our lives are going to change drastically because, you know, spring break was approaching. And I remember that last week, um, I took the day off to participate in this event. And I was actually planning, I was planning a week long kind of vacation with my husband. What we were going to do is um, AHEC was happening and that's kind of like the American Indian like education consortium. And it was happening in Albuquerque and Dinner College usually forms a team and they enter all these different, like there's a knowledge bowl, there's a math bowl and there's like, um, a hand game competition and they do this every year and it's a big deal and the students they like they form a team they prep they get jackets and they go and they represent their college and it's all these different tribal colleges from all over the united states they convene together for this conference and my husband and i were going to go because his book was being featured in the knowledgeable and he was asked to sit as a judge for the competition and then myself, I was a part of the organizing team to kind of assist with the with the team traveling out there and competing. So I, you know, we were both going there for work, and we were excited about it because we were going to take the kids to Meow Wolf in Santa Fe, and we got an Airbnb. We had all of our travel arrangements made, and we were planning to also take. Um, like, you know, I've mentioned before that we have a blended family. And so my, um, my eldest son and my, my younger daughter, my youngest daughter, she, um, they were going to go out to Phoenix and spend the week with their dad for spring break. And they were like really excited about it because they hadn't seen him since like the previous October or something like that. And so they were going to spend the whole week with him. They were all excited. They were already packed. They were ready to go and he had all these things planned for them and we were going to drop them off in phoenix and then we we're going to come through flagstaff pick up the rest of the kids go to albuquerque that was our plan and we were like really excited about it and i swear to god the, the the day after this panel happened basically exactly a year you know to the day we had had this um i guess representatives from the cdc had come to the college and they were like you guys need to get ready something bad is coming and they talked to the president and I, i'm located there in the president's office and it was like this emergency convening that was called they were like you know things are getting bad we need to be concerned um and the conversation was like what are we going to do you know like i think we're going to have to call off the rest of the semester we can't have our students coming back after spring break and it was crazy like we, you know everyone is back together we were told everything that was going on we're kind of brought back to speed and it was just a week later that the first case was reported here in the Navajo Nation so it was nuts so I remember this week vividly because I remember how excited we were about what was coming because we were supposed to go to Albuquerque and then we were also supposed to fly to Chicago and we had our tickets booked and everything. So we had all this travel, you know, happening last March and into April, because we're supposed to go to Albuquerque, Chicago. And then there was also a presentation up at, um, where was it? I think it was Minnesota or something. And it was just, it was nuts. And everything just got canceled. We were grounded. We were told we couldn't travel. 
we were told we had to shelter in place and we that's what we did we just we were we were grounded and we you know nothing was the same after that i remember my mom going on spring break and then never going back to the school again but that mm -hmm. was her last year teaching she was we went back to um u of a u of a's in two right yeah yeah so she she um applied for u of a and she's going back to get another degree in something else and so that was her last year and like she would she had to fight tooth and nail to get the district to let her back into her classroom so she can get her personal stuff okay. and she had one hour to just scoop everything up put it in her vehicle and go but yeah, so that the last thing I heard you say was that she had to. She was trying to get into the classroom to get something. Her stuff, you know, like teachers, they have their own books, they have their own um, stationery, their own materials. Uh -huh. Um, so she had to get in there, try and grab all her stuff before you know they closed for the summer because they weren't going to open it. But she had to fight the district tooth and nail to just get her own personal stuff back. Because, you know, she's a teacher and she's related to me, so she loves stationery. So she has all this array of, like, ink joy pens and her Sharpie markers and, like, all the colors that they have them in. So it's like, I want them back. I'm not giving those to the school. <laughs> so, yeah, but she was, it was only her for an hour to grab all her stuff and vacate well um yeah dang one year i can't believe it i feel like i've aged like 10 years since the beginning of the pandemic it's been so stressful me i kind of feel the opposite i like because i'm an introvert and also a lot of the networking and things that we usually do in person i get so drained huh? physically and mentally being around people I actually feel more interactive and more ready to like socialize with people over the internet, over the phone, just because I don't have to be in that physical proximity it doesn't drain me as fast. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, I don't think, I don't know, when I think about being an extrovert or an introvert, I feel like I'm right in the middle because I get energized by people just, just like, I mean, and I get drained by them, so... I think it just depends on the people. Like, I can be around really positive, awesome people, and I'm just, like, I feel so invigorated being around them. But when I'm around, like, awful people who are just, I don't know, they're, like, energy vampires, <laughs> I get really drained, and I'm just, like, I get a headache, I get grumpy, I get tired, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know what you mean about energy vampires. Like, they can be positive, too. They can be positive people suck the energy out of you for, in for me as an introvert just being in a big room full of people is exhausting yeah me too just kidding not all the time it depends on the people it really does like that i don't know like i've had that experience where i'm working with really great awesome people and i can i can give like 110 percent for long hours days at a time you know what i mean years even but if i'm around people that are just they're, I don't know, there's like something wrong with some people where they're just like, they're not creative or innovative or good to be around, or they're just like, not smart. <laughs> they suck as people. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, why does every day have to be hard? You know what I mean? Like, that's I, I full situations. I understand what you're saying, but I don't know what you mean as a, I don't experience it that way. Like, this year before, I was mm -hmm. going to those NWEAZ meetings um, every other month that they had them, but after that meeting, like, I enjoy the people. I enjoy hanging out with them and hearing, you know, their triumphs and just interacting with them. I enjoy it, but then I have to hibernate for a week because of all the social interactions and, like, opening myself up to be talkative to them and, you know, like, listen to them and try and interact with them. And then I have to like just shut myself down for a week so that I can re-energize myself. And that's for everyone everywhere, no matter what I'm doing, no matter who the person is. 
is it just always drains me and depending on how much i put myself into the situation depends on how much i have to close myself off afterwards to regenerate and with all these webinars and zoom meetings i don't have to put that much energy i can you know i can type on the keyboard and make a statement instead of having to actually talk to people uh -huh. And I don't have to worry about my facial expression so much because my younger brother, Uriah, will tell you that, you know, I don't have a poker face. You can tell when I'm annoyed physically on my face or something. And he's, it makes him laugh, but it really annoys me that you can just read it on my face. I know. I'm like that too. Like, you can tell exactly what I'm thinking. And it's funny because, like, I remember one time there was, oh, I probably shouldn't tell this story. If I get in trouble. But um, <laughs> someone wanted me to do something that I didn't want, I didn't think was safe. And I was kind of, this person made like the statement, like, um, like, like, oh, my staff will do it kind of thing. And I was just like, I just made this face like not me, you know, and everyone could see it. I didn't even have to say anything. And they're like, look at Adrian's face. And I was like, oh, shoot. <laughs> But I was just like, I just like putting my hands up. I was like, you know, if if this is if if there's an option to not to not take part in this, I'm gonna vouch to not take part in this because it doesn't seem safe or smart. You know what I mean? But it was just funny because like all they had to do was look at my face, and the person who said that, like they saw me and they just looked at me like so disappointed. <laughs> It's really hard in like an office environment or like a meeting environment and they someone says something and you're like, no, that's not right. Or like, ah, that's so that's such a ridiculous statement and it's all over your face and you can't hide it. it <laughs> <laughs> I know I still have to like when we have meetings, I still have to like show up with, you know, my camera on so I can't really hide anything, which I think is funny. But like, it's cool. Like with Empower, we're doing Empower. It's this accelerator that um, YKD is a part of, and it's required that you have your camera on during our meetings. And it's been really fun, but it's also been exhausting because like it happens in the evening, right when we get off of work. So it's like from 5.30 to 8.30. And that's usually the time when we have dinner. So we usually get dinner and we bring it home. And well, we're trying to like, you know, eat, while our camera's on and not be rude or you know what I mean it's kind of awkward but I'm just like I showed up <laughs> I'm here but it's just kind of embarrassing when you're like eating in front of everybody yeah I think I stopped being embarrassed I'm like you make this meeting at lunchtime I'm gonna eat if you didn't want that lunchtime you should have made it earlier or later so. I know huh? I just feel unapologetic when I'm eating like big old Navajo taco or something Trying to like eat it like a taco. <laughs> Have you seen that picture of um? I think it's like someone drew Snow White eating a taco, and it looks awful. No, so I'll send it to you. Post it on our <laughs> post it on our Facebook page. <laughs> it's me during Zoom meetings. So, what has your business <laughs> been up to, um, this past month? Um, this past month we've been, like I said, we're a part of the. Power by GoDaddy Accelerator, and we've been focusing a lot on doing a legal review, which has been fun, but it's also a lot of work because we've had to update our business plan. So um, that's something I've been working on, updating the business plan. It's all done except for the financial element because we're focusing on getting our taxes taken care of. Um, I've been working on QuickBooks, get everything going, because we don't have an actual accountant right now. Um, we're doing our own accounting through QuickBooks. It, it's, it's easy because we're not like a big business, you know, right now we don't have a lot of employees. So it's been manageable, but we've been focusing on that because it is tax season and we have to report to the Navajo Nation, uh, the state, federal government, you know, all that stuff. Um, we've also been working on our website. We met with um, we met with a couple people from GoDaddy who reviewed our website and they gave us tips on how to improve it because um, like I said, we switched over to an e-commerce platform, which is new. 
something that we hadn't done before. Um, our website was previously like a blog space. And so I had to completely redo it. Um, and I'm really proud to say that our website is completely updated now. And we've been adding items to our shop, including Navajo Tea Time campfire mugs. So if anybody would like to purchase one of those, you can purchase one through the website online um, through PayPal. So that's cool. And we've also been talking a lot about sales through the accelerator, how to up sales and how to, because we have our own business model that we follow, but meeting with experts and talking with other business owners has been really fun, really energizing. And there are like three other native businesses that are part of the accelerator, like um, Native Renewables and Equinav from down south. So it's really cool to kind of be in their company and talk shop. So that's been really fun. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, so that's what we, we've been doing. That's what kind of been the big focus, you know, just getting everything in order. Um, something I added was, let's see, Yewaka Knowledge Distribution has a YouTube channel. So if anyone would like to check that out, we'll include the link. Um, down below, we we now have a track list for One Note Johnny albums for Memories and Dreams and Historically Looted. So that's new. Um, that's something Michael's been managing on the music side. And our website is at www.teamykd.com. Um, it's been updated. We now have an online store where you can purchase merch and books and services and all that good stuff. So that's what I wrote. Um, I wanted to include those things. So how about you? Yeah, um, we've been working on our YouTube channel kind of post. We were posting every other week, but I think now we're able to post every week because I'm mm -hmm. doing my new um, gaming videos, um, my Let's Play for SimTubing. So the first video uh -huh. should be out and maybe the second episode should be out by the time this podcast goes live. Cool. And then, and then we have our this month, which is just a monthly update with the business on what we're doing and what we want to do. We also have our Change Labs incubator looking at our website, doing a website audit, as they call it. Just, you know, getting more feedback. And then by the time this, this podcast goes live again, um, we would have applied for the FedEx grant. Um, so it's like fifty thousand dollars. So, uh -huh. so we're working on that and the video, and then there's like a voting, uh -huh. a, a voting period between March tenth and March twenty fourth. But this we post on the last Wednesday of the month, so that the voting period would have passed. So I hope you voted for Happy Accidents Media Production in the FedEx grant voting session. Um, mm -hmm. but that's all we're doing right now. Um, Jordan has a couple of clients and we'll have that, um, NCAA client, um, that we're working with monthly. Mm -hmm. Just chugging along slowly, but surely. Taxes too. Oh my god, Taxes. I'm trying to do one little bit week by week because it, it gets me so frustrated of how vague and unspecific but then also very specific, the tax instructions are. Huh. And when you fill up out the taxes yourself, because there's nowhere in Cameron for someone to file business taxes, it's all like personal income tax, not a business tax person. Uh -huh. so, I've, so I've been doing the taxes myself, but it's like, I try to answer, like you read a question or you read one of those things and it's like, but does it apply to this? And it's like, so vague. <laughs> it's like, just tell me yes or no. And then you go on irs.gov, try and get more answers, but it's not helpful. It's so vague, but still very you, specific. Um, there's some, some tea I have regarding the um, grant cycle. So a lot of businesses on the Navajo Nation applied for the economic relief grant through the Navajo Nation. And some people got it, some people didn't. But, you know, as of March, it, you know, the reporting is due. So our business was fortunate enough to get the grant. And that's something we've been working on too, is we, we did work on our report, we did submit it. Um, so thank God. And it's all taken care of. It was actually a really great thing. We're so grateful for it. 
Um, but I remember when we were meeting with the um, Native Women Entrepreneurs at AZ, I was talking about that. I was saying that, you know, when we first got the grant, I, I reported that, yeah, we got it. We're excited about it. We're thankful for it. And a lot of people there were kind of like, yeah, we didn't get it. Like, it, we had a hard time getting a hold of people. We had a hard time with the application. There were all these problems. And after the call, I had a follow-up call with um, one of the members. And she was all like, yeah, after you got off, people were like, who does she know at the Division of Economic Development? Why did she get a grant? You know what I mean? And I thought it was so funny. And I was like, you know what? Like, what a lot of people don't know is that, you know, we we put in for about 10 grants during that season. And we, you know, when we landed that one, we were so grateful because it's kind of this thing where like you're, you're it's like you're fishing. You're casting your line out over and over again, hoping to get a bite. And if you cast your line out enough, eventually you're going to catch something. And that's kind of what it's like with grants. You know what I mean? And I think we're really lucky because I know a lot of people didn't get it. But yeah, I just thought that was funny. Yeah, and like, obviously you deserve the grant, like, but I think the main issue was there were so many unclear issues when applying for the grant, like I asked for an appeal, like, hey, can I talk to somebody to give them an explanation for some of this data that isn't exactly, you know, right for what, like the exact question you asked. Mm -hmm. Because we were denied because our 2019 taxes didn't match up with mm -hmm. what our expenses are now. And there's a giant reason for that because 2019, we weren't full time, all three of us in the business. 2020, mm -hmm. we're all three of us are full time for the business, so we have to pay three people full time monies to survive. And that's a lot mm -hmm. of where the expenses were. And they're like, well, your expenses don't match with what 2019 was. Like, can I have an appeal to argue my point as to why? And they're like, no, it just doesn't match, so we can't give you the time of day. Wow. And that was one of the issues I had was like, they didn't even bother giving me the time of day. And I feel like that's how a lot of the other people felt. And mm -hmm. I don't know, a lot of people were, I, I usually stay on the whole NWEAZ thing. I didn't think a lot of people were talking much about you getting the grant. It's just like, sometimes that feeling is like, oh, well, I had a good experience, so you should all be grateful too, was kind of how it felt when you left. Uh huh. But yeah, like everyone's like, ah, these trying to vent their frustrations and like, well, we got it. So we're good and happy. I don't know. But, you know, sometimes women, especially native women, I'll put in a group some chatty and bitter. It's a really hard thing to overcome, I guess. Yeah, well, I guess I, 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 I thought it was funny. I didn't think anything about it. I mean, I know that there's a lot of frustration there and. I think sometimes when the narrative is just all negative, I don't think there's anything wrong with inserting something positive because it's been like, sometimes that happens, but I do not have a problem with women being frustrated or spaces that are created, created, you know, for, for women to come together are important and they're valuable. So when I encounter things that are frustrating for me and I vent those things openly, you know, it's really nice to have a sounding board of other women who are in similar situations who can, you know, kind of walk me through that, whether it's just lending an encouraging word or sharing a story about how they've been through something similar and how they overcame it, you know? So it's all good. <laughs> no, I understand. It's just, I don't know. You know, it's like, 50 people got rejected from a scholarship and the one person who got it and everyone's just like, you know, <laughs> everyone just wants to go, you know, it, I don't know if it was the coffee thing or if it was the cocktail hour or whatever, you know, sometimes you just want to sit there and want to bitch about things. I guess. Well, that's not why I show up, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they asked me how I was doing, and so I gave them an honest answer. Like, I'm doing great. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm not going to apologize for that. <laughs> like, dude, I work hard, you know? I work just as hard as everyone else. And, you know, 
the majority of the grants we applied for, we got rejected. Um, even, you know, even applying for great opportunities to do incubator services, we got rejected um, more than once. And so getting into the accelerator was awesome, you know, because it was really nice because we had applied for incubator services um, twice, two years in a row. We applied for different fellowships also. We just kept getting denied and we're like, okay. And it was funny because, you know, sometimes the justification would be like, well, it seems like you're doing okay. And there are other businesses out there that might need this help. And I'm just like, no, I need your help. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I'm new to this too. Like, we're relatively new. We started in 2017. And when we started our business, everything was out of pocket and everything was not really built on knowledge that we acquired. It was just really being scrappy, pulling it together and, um, you know, everything was out of pocket, but we wanted to grow, you know, we want to grow. That's what we want to do is become more stable and be able to start offering jobs to other people, you know, start contracting out. And so, yeah, but, you know, I think we get, we, we go through hard times too. We go through denials too. And, you know, it was, I, I thought it was really nice to actually have something positive to report. So that's why I was like, well, I'm not going to apologize for it. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, of course not. Don't apologize. It's kind of like, you know, like when you're in your room playing bingo and then mm -hmm. you're that one person who wins and then everyone for a second just kind of glares at you. But, you know, it doesn't mean we're not happy for you. It's just I would have wanted to win bingo too. But <laughs> Wait, were you the one, one of the people that was... <laughs> I don't talk behind out. people's back. <laughs> Oh, she's all talking trash. <laughs> I'm cheating. <laughs> I didn't talk trash about reality. you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't know about this unless I met with that individual afterwards because she runs the show. And she's always honest with me, which is why I adore her. She's awesome. But she's like, yeah, this is what they were saying about you. I was like, oh, that's funny. <laughs> Oh, I must have tuned it out. I, I don't know. Sometimes I just ignore people. Like, one of my introvert defense mechanisms. Okay, I'm done listening to you guys. Um, <laughs> but also, I've been really bad at remembering things. It's horrible. Like, in, like, my bullet journal, I put a little section of, like, what was your win today? Not because, like, oh, I'm trying... Uh, so sometimes I watch people doing their bullet journals and they have their setups and they have like this gratitude log and I just roll my eyes. I'm like, ugh, I don't like gratitude logs. They seem kind of silly and a little frou-frou and too flowery for me. But then I'm having a hard time remembering what I accomplished that day. Like, in, like any small thing. Mm -hmm. Because I always feel like I'm not getting anything done. So I've been trying every evening to like, okay, I at this meeting today or like today I'm gonna to put down we recorded you know this is something I did today uh -huh. just because it's like what have I done all week I can't think of one single thing that I accomplished all week on my to-do list even though I'm checking off task after task at the end of the week I'm like I did nothing I felt like I accomplished nothing. so I've been just trying to keep track of things I have actually done that I felt like are wins for the day and it's kind of helping but yeah, so my brain's all foggy anyways. I'm 30 now. I can't remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. What, what does it feel like entering your 30s? Okay, so my birthday is on the 4th of January. So like sort of New Year. My birthday happens so I get a kind of New Year, New Me birthday thing. I sternum really started to hurt like it felt like you know like when you need to crack your hand or crack your fingers or something and just builds up that pressure i felt uh -huh. that in my sternum and i'm like i can't crack it it just hurts it's so sore so it was like that for like two days but then it started getting better slowly i'm like it's because i turned 30 i'm old and my body's already breaking down on me like welcome to 30 yeah it's <laughs> like you hit 30 soon kind of like like a car as soon as it hits like 30 three hundred thousand miles everything starts falling off yeah like i hit 30 and all of a sudden i have bone issues well i'm approaching 40 oh now. my goodness <laughs> yeah so <laughs> that's why i'm laughing because it's funny 
So, I've, al yeah. I've always said 30 is where you're old. So now I'm just, okay, I'm old now. I'm 30. I'm old. Kind of like yeah. the plateau. Yeah, for me, I always, that number for me was 50. It, it has been 50 since I was, you know, a kid. So I'm, I'm not feeling any way about it. But um, I think I'm definitely going to feel something when I start approaching 50. But from a lot of women who I listen to, um, they say the 50s are great. They say 60s are amazing. So I'm excited about it. And I plan to live to be 100. So my midlife isn't going to happen until I'm in my 50s. So that's all good. <laughs> so I spent, so I, I spend a lot of time with my grandma. And, yeah. you know, she's in her 80s almost her 80s uh-huh so she's like don't get old kelsey don't get old it's the worst don't get old i'm like huh how am i not gonna get old i don't know if there's a cap i'm gonna reach okay i'm done <laughs> <laughs> just not to be old <laughs> she probably just doesn't want you to get more grumpy than you already are <laughs> i'm like, practically please. an old lady she's like like I drive like an old lady because my grandma's the one who taught me how to drive and I drive her around so we're both little old ladies driving around like there's no one like here just take the freeway I'm like we're gonna go around grandma okay <laughs> you know oh my god speaking of grandma I'm gonna be a grandma really that's exciting yeah so our daughter is our eldest daughter is expecting and she's due I believe in May and so she she let us know over Thanksgiving, and I am so excited. I'm, like, freaking, like, this is, like, the best thing ever. And when my husband and I found out, we were just so, like, filled with love and excitement and, you know, just, like, ready for this next phase of life. And it's such an honor. And I, I remember telling my mom and my aunt, and they were just laughing. They're like, oh, my God, you're too young to be a granny. <laughs> I'm like, but it's happening. <laughs> but it's really cool because she's um, she just turned 26. And when she told us, I remember telling her that, um, you know, I, I don't know, we, we kind of sat down together and we had this very important family talk, you know, of, okay, what are you going to do? How are we going to do this? You know, and we talked with her and, and her guy, and it was just really cool. Like I immediately felt different. And I remember I was, before we found out, I was stressing out over some things related to work. And, you know, it was really like, it was, there was a lot going on. And a lot of really stressful things going on that were just really eating at me. And I swear to God, after we found this out, it almost felt like nothing else mattered. I was just like, you know what? All that stuff is not as important. You know what I mean? Like, all that stuff is just going to roll off my back. Like, whatever. I don't even have to worry about this no more. Like, my whole focus shifted. My whole perspective shifted. And I just felt this really amazing calm and this excitement and this love and and it was cool that she told us at a great time because it was on thanksgiving day and the next day was black friday so i kind of went nuts and i bought a whole bunch of stuff for the baby <laughs> like i got her all the good stuff like i got her the same travel system that i used for all the little babies um like the best one highest safety rating I got her a Dock a Tot, which we know is like, it's super, I mean, if anyone who's ever had a little infant and knows what a Dock a Tot is, you know that's what's up. I got her a GGB backpack or like a diaper bag backpack. And those things were like almost $200. But I was like, only the best for my grandbaby. <laughs> like I went nuts. I got her like the best of everything. <laughs> It's so funny, and I just, I love it. Like, every payday, I go shopping for her, and I'm so excited. Yeah, we're actually looking for an apartment for her right now, too, because she and her guy were living with people that have roommates, and I'm just like, they can't bring a new baby into that environment, you know? And so this weekend, we're, we decided what we're going to do, and we're going to make sure that she has her own place. So we're like, you have by the end of the week to find a place. And she's like, can you co-sign for me, you know, all this stuff? And we're like, 
well, first you need to find a place you know you can afford, but at least it'll be your own. And of course, we're gonna help you no matter, you know, in any way we can, no matter how or what we have to do, we'll do it. So we're really excited. We're just like stepping up, you know what I mean? And it's really cool, like it's so awesome. And I remember people were asking me like, do you wanna have more kids? And I'm just like, no. <laughs> I'm going to be a grandma. Come on. <laughs> like, I don't need to be having more kids. Crazy. <laughs> but yeah, it's cool. I love it. I'm excited. Did you notice a change in your little one? Yeah. 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 Because in December, Frankie, it was like a switch flipped in her. And she was just being awesome. this really clingy baby always wanting to be cuddled and held and in everyone's business with everything and I'm like what's wrong with you you're not like this and then last month my cousin sent a picture she's like I'm two months pregnant uh, blah 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 we found out in December but kept it quiet for a little while I'm like you you're the reason she's like this <laughs> <laughs> and every time like someone's pregnant frankie's just like this little sloth of a baby hugging on to me and i'm like who is it who's the one who made you this way yeah we knew like he was doing all the stuff that kids do when someone's expecting you know what i mean all the stuff like he was like he, he was doing that thing with his fingers where he wraps them around each other and he was doing a thing where he was like looking between his legs, like through his legs. And I'm just like, oh my God, someone's pregnant. And then he started acting up, like he would catch Josh and I was like, oh man. And so when um, it snowed, I gave him a snow bath and I did that thing where they say that when your kid, um, if someone's expecting your kids are acting like that, that you're supposed to take them outside when it's like, when it's snowed and have them stand under a tree and shake it and have all that snow fall on them. And that's supposed to help. And so we did that for all the kids. I was like, get outside. Like, I'm not going to. <laughs> they were all being like that. It was just funny. They were all just being really clingy and like wanting hugs. Like, once I got up and like, they always follow me around like Mama Doug all day. It was funny. Well, we didn't have any snow in Cameron, not enough to shake out of a tree didn't even have enough to roll her in a snow bath. Well, you have Flagstaff, so there's a lot of trees there. We were hardly we ever going to flag. Really? Yeah. Almost never, except for like business for shopping, and then it's just there and back with my linger in Flagstaff. Mm-hmm. I know, it's super busy in Flagstaff. Speaking of no. snow, have you guys started planting yet? Oh, yeah. Okay. I love this topic. So, no, we have not, but we are planning to plant again this year. So, we are planning. So, last year was the first time we ever planted a cornfield, and we did okay. I think we could have done better. Um, we, all we got was, like, some type of beans, but we didn't get any actual corn because um, we, so we planted late. We didn't plant until, like, the end of May, I think it was. And then the the corn started or the, the stalks started to grow. A few of them were pretty tall, but um, yeah, they didn't really produce any corn. And another thing too was like early fall, we got we got this um, cold front that came down and it actually froze the ground for three weeks. There were three nights when it was just super cold, and we went out there and we tried to protect the stalks. We we built these like cardboard coverings that would like go over the stalks and we got blankets and we got plastic bags because that's what um, Mike's grandma used to do so we, we did our best to try to protect the corn but the last night we were like it kind of got warm during the day and we we're like okay I think we're good so we removed everything and then it came again and it freaking froze like it was like 10 degrees or something outside and it, it, it killed them they just went yellow after that so I was like, oh, man, we should have covered them. And we didn't. And they went yellow. And I was like, oh, man. So that's what happened. So this year, we're going to plant early. We're going to plant this month. And um, we're going to plant blue, white, and yellow corn. That's what we planted last year, too. But we're gonna, that's what we have seeds for. And 
what we're going to do is um, we got some tips from some of our, our friends that plant every year. And so we're going to try out some of their tips um, here. Like, like, for example, one person told us that they actually use miracle Grow when you first, like, after you till and you create those, um, like, we actually know how to set up the corn fill now because last year we didn't. We are total amateurs. So now we know exactly how to set it up. We know um, the distance everything needs to be because before it was like, I don't know, I think we could have done it better. But we're, we know how to set it up now. We know how to make sure that we have um, it kind of like built up, like we have all the dirt built up in a way that it can hold water effectively. We also know how much water we need because we didn't know last time. We're total amateurs, but this year we know. Um, we know how frequently we need to water, and we're going to actually try miracle grow when we put the seeds in the ground. But that's what we're going to do um, this year. The last year, when we did it, we had all of the, ki the kids plant the seeds because we were told that they should be the ones to put the seeds in the ground. And we had them all wear turquoise in the cornfield, which I thought was helpful. And then we got spring water from the mountain, and that's how we started our field. So we're probably going to do those same things, but in addition to actually knowing what we're doing and how to set it up properly. I think that's it. How about you? Are you going to plant this year? Um, well, last year we tried planting late. We, we did plant late, too, because I was like, what are we going to do all day at home? Yeah. Oh, I guess we'll try and grow some vegetables in case mm -hmm. food shortages happen. Um, uh -huh. but <clears throat> like in the middle of summer there was this really big heat wave and so uh -huh. a lot of our plants went dormant and stopped flowering uh -huh. and then once it cooled down again then they started flowering again I'm like that was kind of random one night when I was like I go, I go through these episodes of insomnia and so I just uh -huh. look for new YouTube goes to what youtube channels to watch and i found this one called epic epic gardener he's really informative of like some of this stuff and one of the things he talks about is no dig planting also composting i'm trying to get into compost so i'm not taking so much trash out which food waste so what we did for our bigger gar our vegetable garden is we're just letting that soil rest so we put some um, partial compost food underneath a layer of cardboard and we're gonna layer it up later on when we get some more uh, wood chips and sand and then just layer that on top and just let that soil ferment, I don't know, get better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I just built a bunch of little um, raised beds in front of my house so I don't have to go too far. I mainly want to plant herbs and flowers this year, not so much vegetable heavy. So I already have some of my flower seedling growing. I have lavender and mint. Um, we're going to plant potatoes because I saw a video and it showed how easy potatoes are to plant. And then zucchini and try planting some gourds again because Vernon was gourds make rattles. Uh -huh. but, but we planted too late, so then when they were supposed to start maturing into a bigger fruit gourd, that's when the heat wave came, so it just kind of stunted their growth, even though we were watering them. So, And also, that channel told me that it's best to water in the morning, especially if you live in a really hot area, because then that gives the plants the strength to make it through the day. I'm like, oh. oh, I guess that makes sense. <laughs> Because I used to plant it in the evening where it was more convenient for me to be outside planting them. But if you plant it in the morning, it gives them the strength to make it through the day. Yeah, that makes sense. That's what a lot of people are telling us, too. Like, you need to go out there early in the morning. And I didn't really understand why, but, like, what you're saying explains it. Like, that really does make a lot of sense. Yeah, and I'm really trying to get the hang of composting. Because out here, it's really dry and arid, so the composting doesn't work as efficiently as, like, a place that was that's more moist because compost needs to stay needs to stay moist but also airy so that like the little microbes and tiny little buggies break down the food and turn it into good plant life mm -hmm. or not plant life plant food yeah so yeah, I'm, just, that makes sense. I'm just trying to try different things to figure out how to get compost because 
there's a lot of different types of like you, you you just said miracle grow but like watching this epic gardener's channel during one of my insomniac somniatic somniatic i don't know my sleepless nights um there's different types of like not not just the generic uh, not generic but the name brand miracle grow there's like mushroom compost there's like animal manure compost or you can make your own compost and you know there's different types for what type of vegetable you're growing like i also saw another video where you add wood ash to certain types of vegetables but not to other ones so you have to see like if they want a more acidic soil or a more basic soil there's just different types of science that goes into planting that yeah. is a lot more intense than just you know digging a hole putting a seed in and watering every day yeah it, it's definitely more more than that that's what i learned last year all of the um planters people who i know who do this every year and are successful they all swear you got to get up early in the morning and take care of your plants like that's just what you have to do and you can't neglect them and you have to talk to them and really you know be there for them and so last year we would go to the fields and you know like talk to them and sing to them and just like build that relationship but another thing too is you have to take care of them and i think that's where we fell off at one point because we had left for two weeks um i think it was two weeks or the week we left for a week and we forgot to or we we, we neglected <laughs> to to have someone go out there and water them uh, water the plants and take care of them and we came back and they were not doing good. They were all droopy and sad. And I felt so bad when we drove we drove up and I was like, no, we forgot. And so I learned that you really have to take care of them. You can't just like expect them to thrive, you know, without you being there. So I'm gonna make sure not to do that this year. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of like um a meme I saw. It's like a rose. If I don't plant, if I don't give it the right soil, it wilts and dies. And then dandelion just bursts through the concrete. <laughs> I know those those dandelions, man. Can't hold them down. <laughs> they're like we're gonna live no matter what, whether you like it or not. <laughs> yeah. And they're actually very healthy for you, dandelions. You can make teas and you can just eat the leaves. They're they're actually quite mm -hmm. nutritious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had dandelion tea before. It's pretty good. One thing I felt that's really helpful with my gardening is that joining groups, like a gardening group where you can ask people questions and they respond to you, uh -huh. actually helpful. And so I joined Navajo gardening group. And it's been really helpful in um, getting a different perspective because you can look and see, like, you know, what your zone is, gardening zone. But I feel like the reservation is like a really weird pocket because technically the first frost or whatever is this but you know you go 30 minutes or 30 minutes to tuba it's different climate di different soil yeah. and you go an hour to flagstaff completely different elevation so <laughs> so you know having people who know exactly what your soil does and the actual weather in your area is helpful especially for, it's been helpful for me and talking and like saying oh this is what i did and just sharing because i shared a post of like how i made my garden fence out of wood pallets and the lady was like i never thought of that i've been having trouble with horses just coming in and eating my my plants and i'm like the wood pallets help because they're kind of stronger and sturdier than just a wire fence but i have tons of wood pallets uh -huh. hanging around so there's two topics I want to deep dive into later on in the year. One being um, alternative power and another uh -huh. being cooling. Where are we going from here? You know, just really talk about our issues and concerns with our kids in school. So um, I don't know when we would be mentally prepared for either of those conversations. But I think those would be pretty cool to talk about later on in the this yeah. year. And maybe we can get okay. some guests, um, maybe an educator or um, someone who has some 
ideas about alternative power. You have your business, your solar power business, maybe an educator who, um, or someone who was a former educator who isn't afraid of a negative backlash from the board that happened. Yeah, I think there's two people I know who are doing solar projects on Navajo also. And maybe I can invite them into having that conversation. And we could, because we're all servicing, you know, the Navajo Nation, but at different levels. So they're, they're kind of operating in kilowatt systems. And my company is operating as uh, an official vendor for Goal Zero products, which are, you know, portable power stations that are res tested, grandma approved. Do you know what I mean? They've been used on the Navajo Nation since 2011. They're affordable. They're not gonna, you know, they're a really great investment and they're perfect for online learning or working at home. So yeah, I would love to have that conversation. And if anyone is interested in purchasing, go to my website. <laughs> you can see what I currently have in stock, but we can order anything from the Goal Zero catalog for you. We also offer installation services. Um, we can offer any kind of um, assistance and education also. Um, I've been working with this company for many, many years and I'm very familiar with their with the technology. But also, you know, we're committed to servicing the people on the Navajo and Hopi nations. So we deliver anywhere within the four sacred mountains. So that includes um, Hopi. So what okay. is that? One more thing I just forgot, but now I remembered because I saw my sticky note I put. Women's History Month. <clears throat> so we talked about good women in history. I was wondering if you have a favorite, like either movie villain or some woman who was just like the okay. worst in history. Because I feel <laughs> oh like God. we need to talk about the bad along with the good because we can't just say bad women didn't happen in history. Yes, there's so many bad women. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, that's that's a great point. I love that. I wish we would have had this conversation earlier in the podcast, but for sure, like, okay, so who's your favorite villain, I guess? Well, I don't know if I have, like, a favorite villain, but I just watched this movie recently called Doctor Sleep, and in that movie, the main villain is a woman and uh -huh. like she's not treated like oh she's a woman villain because you know how like sometimes uh -huh. like oh their motives are like a man scorned her or she just hasn't found love or something like that no she was just like a regular villain but happened to be a woman and uh -huh. i really loved that you don't really see female villains given that treatment where like oh no they don't have to have a reason to be bad they can just be an evil person they don't need to be scorned by a lover or have daddy issues or need to be loved the right way. They could just be a horrible person as a woman. And that's just equal representation. Yeah. When I was a kid, the person who used to scare me the most was that lady um, in the movie Mommy Dearest and also Carrie's mom. Remember how like abusive they were? They were just so freaking psycho. Mm -hmm. And now... Every now and then I'll listen to, um, I listen to this crime podcast called Case File, and sometimes they'll talk about um, people, like couples that target, target victims, and they work together because a lot of people think women are like, they're, they're, they're nothing to be afraid of, and they often trust women, and so there'll be these couples that will like stalk and groom their victims and then the woman will be the one to kind of lure them in and then that person will end up you know getting butchered or something it's crazy and so those are those are the women I always like try to keep at the top of my mind too because I know that men and women are both very capable of being evil and doing evil things and I, you know I don't want to always be like I don't want to be the kind of person that glosses over that only because we have to be vigilant sometimes and not trust everybody especially just because they're a woman or appear to be a woman and when I was doing work with the um, missing and murdered dinner relatives initiative 
that was something that was brought up and it was something that really disturbed me because there are reports of women on the Navajo Nation who actually sell their children and traffic their children for drugs. And the police know about it. This is all documented. Those children have been rescued and they're safe now, but it does happen. And it's effed up. It gets me so angry that there are women here that you would think would know better, but they don't. And they're actually putting their own kids in, in these horrible situations because, you know, out of desperation. And it's really messed up. And so being cognizant of that and then having to also go the extra mile to find out why, you know, why, what is the, what factors are involved that make this, this situation happen. And that's really interesting too, because a lot of times it's really due to desperation and poverty. And sometimes, you know, women are put in situations where they don't know any other way and they're desperate and that happens. It's really crazy. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's, there's months, you know, in the year that are, are dedicated to having these conversations. Like I know October, I think it's like sexual abuse awareness month. And when I was in, you know, in the de um, studying women's and gender studies, that was a time when you, a lot of those conversations and stories were told and addressed and a lot of those healing circles would happen. I think it's also a domestic violence awareness month and it's crazy, but I, I guess when you're, when you're in that field and you're trying to find solutions to some of these hard pro problems, these bigger problems, you hear those stories and it's just like, what the hell, you know what I mean? It, it does eat away at you, but yeah, women can definitely be villains and a lot of villains are made, but you know, that's another conversation. <laughs> yeah, no, cause I listened to um, this Ooh. other um, crime podcast yeah. called Morbid. And they do talk about some of the more, like, the female serial killers and, like, the couple killers. And sometimes it's the women instigating the crime and making the man the, um, like, the dominant and the submissive yeah. dynamics of some of those um, couples. It's just, it's an interesting topic. I know we're trying to be, like, you know, we like to stay positive and um, uplifting, but sometimes I... My family has a history of diabetes. Too much sweetness would be bad for me. Yeah, all I'm saying is, like, I think we're staying true to what we're doing here with Navajo Tea Time is we're talking about these things that, you know, they're all topics, and these are pretty serious topics, but, you know, they're relevant. And they're important, and we need to think about them and find a way to stop it, you know? Yeah, for sure, but, you know, I like, I just found the sticky note, and it was, like, at the end of everything, so... Maybe we can continue this conversation. <laughs> All right. So this has been Navajo Tea Time, March 2021. A lot of interesting topics today. More to dive into again later on in the year. Um, let us know what you want us to dive into. Um, the power plant being demolished, alternative energy, schooling. We can just rant about schooling and education. I can rant about schooling and education until I'm blue in the face. But, you know, what do you guys want to hear? And um, don't forget to like, subscribe, share. We're at Navajo Tea Time on Instagram and Facebook. Yeah, and you can also send emails to Navajo Tea Time at gmail.com. You know, I really hope people who actually take the time to watch our videos and listen to these super long conversations that we have, I hope they look their way in their masks when they go out. That would be awesome. Like, do the nation a solid and just wear your mask, even though it's annoying. Get a cool one, you know, get a get one that's, like, comfortable to wear because there are some that are comfortable and there are some that are really pretty. And you know what I found out about wearing masks? It's really cool is you don't have to wear your makeup <laughs> if you don't want to. <laughs> Like, seriously, there. I go to work now with my mask on, and I just put on mascara, and I'm good all day. And my skin, like, gets to breathe, and it's not, I don't have all this makeup on it, and I love it. <laughs> it's exciting and fun. Talk to you guys later. Bye. Goshi.